Okay, this is the start of our last section this year for Zoo 3649, and the section is called Molecular Ecology. And the last two sections, this one plus the last one, speciation, as I told you before, they're, they're designed for you to apply all the things that you learned in the first four sections, okay? And molecular ecology in particular shows us how we can apply genetics to the real world, especially with regard to conservation. Okay, so in that regard, my first, my first lecture, lecture 36, is going to be about the effective population size. Okay, and I'm and I'm and I'm uh, stressing this uh, um, NE, the effective population size, because this is a crucial measurement in genetics. Okay, remember, NE is how we measure the effect of which force of evolution. By now, all of you should be saying without even realizing that you're saying it, you should be saying genetic drift just like that, right? Yes, and you're right because NE is a way to measure genetic drift. If you're still unsure about this, you are not ready to, to write the exam for this module. You've got to go back and watch every lecture again. Okay, so the effective population size is important because it is a measurement of genetic drift. It tells us how many breeders we have in the population. And in conservation, that's really important to know. We need to know how genetically diverse our populations are and how genetically diverse they're going to remain. Okay, and we know that by knowing the number of breeding individuals. All right, so um, the uh, official way of um, uh, defining uh, an effective population, uh, the NE, effective population size, is the size of an idealized population whose genetic dynamics are the same as a population we're studying. So in other words, uh, it is the size of this idealized population so already you can see ah, what is this idealized doesn't that remind you of something uh -huh. it reminds you of the right fisher population exactly because it's an idealized uh, that's an idealized population and it's idealized why so that we can determine the effect of genetic drift and not any of the other forces of evolution. That's why we have a right fisher population. And the effective population size stems from a right fisher population. In fact, Wright figured out that the effective si population size was a property of his right fisher population. Okay. The another way of defining uh, NE is is the average number of individuals in the population that actually breed. Okay, that actually breed successfully and pass their genes on to the next population. Ideal, right? I've actually um, answered this question already. Why is it an ideal uh, population? And that is because we're talking about a right fisher population that had only neutral variation, in other words, variation due to genetic drift. So no selection, no structure, no, no fitness um, and random mating. So that is your idealized population. So how do we use a, a right fisher population, this idealized population, to model genetic drift and i keep coming back to this question over and over and over again in this module that should be telling you something guys if you are watching these lectures there's no way you're not going to do well in this module because you've p collected all the tips that i've been giving you right that's because you watch the lectures. If you didn't watch the lectures, well, I might be seeing you next year, but that's okay. It's not my business. It's your business because you've got the lectures. It's not my problem if you don't watch them. Okay, so how do we use a right fisher? How did Wright use this population to model, this idealized population to model drift? Well, firstly, it is idealized so that no other force of evolution is happening except for genetic drift. And how do we know genetic drift is happening? Because our population size of the right fisher population is constant. Remember, it has a size. It's not infinite. If it was infinite, there would be no drift, right? But it's, it's got all the other idealized, um, it's got all the other forces taken out, but it's got a po constant population size, which means drift is not taken out. Drift is there. 
Okay, so how do we use it to model drift? And you know this already. In the absence of no other force, there are three ways to model genetic drift. Okay, and if you see this um, um, question in a test or an exam, please don't just memorize this because you probably not you probably might not even get half the marks if you memorize. I want details. Okay, if I ask you a question with ten marks, I want details. I don't want just a couple of lines uh, memorizing a slide. All right, I want details. If you just memorize the slide and regurgitate the slide word for word, you will not get more than. In fact, you will not even get half the marks for that question. You will not get more than, you will not get five even. All right? And that means fail. So please, memorization is not going to help you. The rate at which two populations diverge, two right fisher populations diverge from each other, will be 1 over 2n. That's the rate where n is the population size. The rate at which homozygosity increases in a closed right fisher population is determined also by 1 over 2n. That is the rate of uh, increase in homozygosity. That is otherwise known as what? The inbreeding coefficient. Okay. Why are we using 2n? Why are we using 2n? That is for you to know. That's been explained to you so many times. I don't need to explain it again here. Okay. Go and watch the other lectures. And the third way to model drift is using the 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 the, the new method I taught you in the last couple of sections coalescence okay this coalescence bringing trees together with populations right and so we can use this coalescent method to work backwards in time and you know how we derived 1 over 2n because I did it together with you we derived it together remember the probability of having a parent in the gener the generation before is 1 and the probability of two individuals having the same parent is what 1 over 2n Okay, so you're going to have to explain all that if you're answering this question in a test or an exam. If you just give these three lines here, forget getting even 5 out of 10. All right, so back to effective population size. Um, we need to know this because it is a very convenient way of summarizing what is happening in that population. Okay, that is why it's a very important statistic in conservation genetics. All right, because if you know the NE, you actually know a lot about the population. You know how much drift there is, you know uh, how much genetic diversity there is, and you know how healthy the population is. All that stuff just by knowing NE. Isn't that brilliant? That's why NE is so important. Okay, NE can also uh, determine how effective selection is in the population. It can also determine how uh, uh, efficient uh, migrations or new mutations are in the population, okay? Because all of those things you have to multiply by NE, okay? So NE is extremely useful to know, right? So there are three ways. In fact, there are more than three ways, and you will be getting the other ways during honors. But just for third year, I will give you a, a sort of taster. There are three ways. There are these three ways that I've given you here. Of calculating NE and they're each slightly different you can calculate them from sex ratios so how many males and how many females from how populations have changed with time and from variance in mating success just to, uh, to, to to determine um, how many breeders because remember at the at the end of the day NE is basically your breeding stock how many breeders do you have in that population so let's take the first method based on sex ratios that is um, uh, NE is equal to four times the number of males multiplied by the number of females divided by the number of males plus the number of females. Okay, very simple. So if you know the number of males and the number of females, you can easily work out this NE. Okay, so NM is the number of breeding males, NF is the number of breeding females. So if we have um, if we have fifty, if we have a, a population of fifty. Now, say we have 50 cows. It's not even about conservation. Let's make this about farming, okay? Let's, let's, let's have 50 cows, okay? Now, if you've got 50 cows, uh, you can consider yourself quite, quite, quite okay, right? I mean, it's a lot of money. You know, each cow, multiply that by 50. It's quite a lot of money. So, if you've got 50 cows, I think you are, you're doing quite well, right? But, 
which is a question no, no one ever asks. And this is why you're going to all go back home this Christmas and you're all going to be so clever because you're going to be telling your parents this and your grandparents this. You're going to be saying, I bagogo, we've got 50 cows. Mare, how healthy are those cows? Gogo will say, ah, they're healthy. No. You can determine how healthy they are by calculating the effective population size. If the effective population size is close to the census size, in other words, close to 50, because you have 50 cows, that's your census size, uh, then your, 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 your herd is healthy. If your effective population size is much lower than the census size, the actual number of individuals in the population, then that population is not healthy. Okay? And after a few generations, you will see bad genetic effects of inbreeding and so on in that population. So what can you do in that situation? Bring cows from another herd, right? Because why? Then you don't, you don't have a closed population. You don't have only genetic drift affecting the population. You can bring in cow from another herd, sell one cow to another guy uh, and, and get a cow from him. Then you bring new alleles into your population and you're keeping the genetic diversity high and the health of the population high. But so how do you work out now? Let's just say we had a population size of 50, right? But we know in that population size of 50, only 20 are mature cows that can, that can breed, right? Only 20 of the 50. Because remember, some of them are going to be youngsters. They're not ready to breed yet. Now comes the, comes the thing. If you use one bull or two bulls or a few bulls and many cows, which is what we are doing, right? Normally, we find the makulu, right? That one that is beautiful. And you're like, I'm going to take him and I'm going to have lots of babies and they're all going to look big and makulu like him. No, that's, 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 what you, that's what you get. That's what will happen. You will inbreed that population. You can do it for one generation. But please, don't make the mistake of taking that makulu and breeding him with his, with his own daughters. Bad mistake. Bad mistake. Okay, so even if you're just using one bull, it's a bad mistake, right? Let's work it out. Why? Okay, let's just say we're not even using one bull. We're using two bulls, right? And we are using, we got 20 cows. The rest of them, don't worry, they're youngsters. Okay, so now what's going to happen? Our effective population size is what? It is four times two times 20 divided by two plus 20 and that gives you 7.3 7.3 you have a census size of 50 and your effective population size is only 7.3 that population is cruising for a bruising that population is going to be extinct in a couple of generations because why they're all going to be unhealthy so please make sure that you have in, you breed with enough males, okay? And that 7.3 is too low. It has to be higher. You have to make that number become close to this number, okay? Because if it's not close to this number, if it's so low, that population, this population with 50, you think you have 50, you have enough. No, you don't. Because you, your effective size is only 7.3, not 50. You only have 7.3. That means that the population... Is, is genetic drift is going to hammer that population. You're going to be, all those cows are going to be losing alleles. Because why? Most of the males cannot give their alleles to the next generation. You're only choosing one or two males to give their alleles to the next generation. Okay? That's the problem. Okay. So NE can be very different from the census size because not all breed. All right? And you as a farmer, you've got to control how many of these just because it's a big big makulu bull doesn't mean that you should only use him forever that's a huge mistake that many farmers do and they end up crying okay so that is one clever thing you can go home this christmas and you can tell all your family ah ha, ha, i know how to work this stuff out now because i learned it in zoo 3649 Oh, there are other ways based on population size change other ways to work out the effective population size and um, for example, if uh, you see here, time is going here like this. So this is the past. This is the present. And so the population went through 
different sizes, okay? Because maybe they had a population bottleneck, they were reduced here in, in, in time two and time three, okay? But uh, what you can do is take the harmonic mean. So you go one over NE is equal to one over T, which is the number of times. So it'll be, in this case, it'll be four, okay? And multiplied by the sum of one over N for each time frame, okay? So it'll be the sum of one over N for each T. That means there's four T's here, okay? So let's, let's, let's see. You have one divided by N1 plus one divided by N2 plus one divided by N3 and plus one divided by N4. And you sum them up, that's why I said plus. And then whatever you get, you multiply by one over four because you, T is four because you have four time points. And then you take the reciprocal of that number and you got your NE. Okay, so that's, that's how you do it. And this is another way to, uh, to, to calculate the effective population size. It's called the harmonic mean, and it is very sensitive to po small population size. Why? Because it's one over the population size, okay? When I have the N on top, then it's a small number. If I have the N at the bottom, then it's a big number, okay? Relatively a big number, okay? So because N is here at the bottom, it has a massive influence on this NE here, okay? And the last way is based on variance and mating success, and here's the formula for NE. And basically, four times N, which is the census size, minus two, divided by the variance in mating, okay, plus two. So, so variance in mating, let's unpack that for a moment. What does it mean when I say there's high variance in mating success? What, is, what, what do I mean by this high variance in breeding success or mating success? High variance means there's a big range of values, right? That means that high variance in breeding success means that some individuals will breed a lot and some individuals will not breed at all. Okay, that is what I, I mean by high variance in breeding success. And that's not good for NE. Okay, when some individuals are dominating all the breedings, maybe because it's those two bulls that your grandfather is, is always mating with the same cows, maybe that's why uh, there's big variance in mating success, because those two bulls, they're going to get all the matings, and the others, they're going to get zero. So there's a big variance in mating success. Okay, but what happens if you, if you had... Um, if you used all, if you had 10 bulls and you use all of them to breed, right, then you will maybe have one, each and every one of them breeding successfully. Then what does it mean? All of them are breeding successfully and the variance in mating success is low. And when all of them are breeding successfully, it means what? It means that NE is going to be high because you're keeping all the alleles in the population. You're not allowing drift to get rid of the alleles because some of them are what? Are not mating. And that's why drift gets rid of the alleles, okay? So if some males breed a lot and some breed very little, the variance in mating success will be high. And if variance in, in, in mating success is high, in other words, if this is the, this is the uh, denominator here. If the denominator is high, then this number will be low because it's one over that high number. All right, so how is NE, effective size, uh, um, related to genetic diversity? Well, it is very close to genetic diversity. If you know the NE, you know the genetic diversity of the population. Okay, here is the uh, on the on the left hand side. Uh, this uh, y axis is genetic diversity, and here is over generations. All right, and so as you know, when your NE is small, when your population size, effective number of breeders is small, what will happen to genetic diversity over time? you will lose alleles, right? You know this. You know this from our simulations uh, during our practicals. So you will every generation lose when you have a size of 25, right? But if you have your size of 50, you will also lose, but not so much. If you have your size 125, you will also lose, but not so much, okay? If you have a big population of 500, you will also lose, but very little. To lose nothing, what size does your population have to be? 
infinite, right? It has to be infinite for genetic drift to not lose any diversity, right? So basically, NE, the lower your NE, the lower the genetic diversity would be. Okay, that is what the relationship between genetic diversity and effective population size. You have fewer breeders, you will end up with lower genetic diversity with time. Okay, the lower the any, the more chance of losing diversity in a population through genetic drift. Okay, you know this already from our practicals. We don't really need to get into it. Um, how do you actually estimate um, the uh, mutation rate or the population parameter theta? Okay, so theta, and I've given you this formula, theta is equal to 4 NE mu, is equal to 4 times the NE times mu, the mutation rate. Okay, here it is, 4 NE mu, okay? And we can calculate uh, this um, theta in two different ways. We can calculate it from the number of polymorphic sites in a DNA sequence, and we can calculate it from the nucleotide diversity of the DNA sequence. In other words, the average difference between each pair of DNA sequences, okay? And if these two... So there are two ways of estimating this population parameter, theta, okay? And if both of them are the same, then your population is evolving according to neutral expectation, okay? It's, according, it's, it's evolving according to the neutral theory because this here is the great neutral theory equation. The last time you saw this was in the lecture for the neutral theory. Okay, this was Professor Kimura's great formula for the neutral theory. And we can use this formula to see if our sequences are evolving in a neutral way or if they're violating the neutral expectation. All right, so and we will get to that in our next lecture where we're talking about selection because we want to infer selection and the way we infer selection is by looking for violations of the neutral theory. Okay. But that's the next lecture. Let's stick with effective population size for now, right? Um, so depending, of because you calculate theta from from a, from a DNA from DNA sequences, depending on which DNA sequence you use, you will get a different value for theta. So not all genes, uh, uh, DNA pieces of DNA sequences of DNA will give you the same theta. So some parts of the genome will have a high mutation rate. Right, uh, and they will give you a so th this mu will be high, and so their theta will be high. Some parts of the genome have a low mu, a low mutation rate, and so theta will be low. So theta varies from gene to gene. Okay, there is no overall theta for all genes. Theta varies from gene to gene. Okay, so how do we uh, calculate theta, this uh, um, population parameter for any mu? How do we calculate it from polymorphic sites in a DNA sequence? Okay, so this, this way of calculating theta, it's also known as Watterson's theta, because Watterson was a guy in the 1960s who came up with this way of calculating theta. Okay, now say we have these three DNA sequences, okay? And we have, um, we have um, um, these different bases, and what we want to see is the average number of differences, okay? So basically, theta is the number of sites divided by the sum of one over the number of uh, sites, or the num one over the number of mutations, okay? So Sn is the number of polymorphic sites, okay? And so how do we do that? We go before I put that up and cheat, let us actually work it out from the DNA sequence. So you've lined up these homologous DNA sequences, right? You sequence a different individual. Now you've got these three individuals, three people. It can be three people from our class even, right? But here are the DNA sequences. So I've, I've, I've made life easy for you, but I've put a star under the place where there's a difference in the DNA sequence. So here there's a G. And the other two has a T. So there's a here. Whereas here, you see all of them have a C. Then there's no star. Everyone is the same, right? And then here, everyone is the same. Here, everyone's the same. Here, everyone's the same. Ah, here, this one has a C, and these two have a T. So then I put a star there. 
Okay, so now you can see that there's three stars. That means there's only three places. Okay, and this star should not be here. It should be there under the C because it's it's a C and the other two have a T. Okay, so that star is in the wrong place there. It should be under the C. But nevertheless, there are three places for these three DNA sequences. There are three places where there are mutations, differences. So SN is the number of polymorphic sites. That's three. Okay, and then and then what is what do we do here divided by the sum of that's why we have a plus here one divided by what one okay and one plus one divided by what's the other i two okay where n minus one i is equal to one okay for n minus one that's why we do one and two and we don't have a three why we don't have a three because we only have three sites okay and n minus one is what n is three n minus one is two so we can only have two one over one and one over two here okay and we get uh, a, a value of two for theta based on these dna sequences all right how can we work it out from nucleotide diversity so this is the second way to work out theta okay so nucleotide diversity is the average number of pairwise differences in the population okay so what is the let's take that means let's take each pair okay let's take allele one and allele two individual one and individual two how many differences do they have they've got this difference here and they've got this difference here so this pair has got two differences all right how about this pair this one and this one two and three how many differences they got one there's no difference there. Two. They've got two differences. Okay? So the first pair has two differences. The second pair has two differences. What about the third pair? So that would be one and three. They have one difference here. They have another difference here, C and T. And they have no differences. So they have two differences. Okay. So the first pair had two differences, the second pair had two differences, and the third pair have two differences. So what is the average number of pairwise differences? It is 2 plus 2 plus 2 divided by 3, which will give you 2. So we get 2 again. from new, for, So we calculate theta in another way, and we still get theta equals 2. Okay? And so... The ratio between 1 and 2, in other words, the ratio between theta calculated from Watterson's theta and the ratio between Watterson's theta and nucleotide diversity pi is known as Tajima's D. Okay? And we're going to get to this in the next lecture. Tajima's D is going to be featuring in the next lecture. You will need to know it for your exam. You will need to know it for your, uh, for your test, test 2. Um, and the ratio between 1 and 2 determines Tajima's D and when Tajima's D is zero it means that the population is evolving under Kimura's neutral theory under neutral expectation okay when Tajima's D, D goes to one towards one or minus one or minus two or two or any other number except for zero then you that means that these two the thetas, they are not the same anymore, okay? And that is telling you that the population is being pushed away from neutrality. And what force of evolution is pushing it away from neutrality? It's almost always selection that does that, okay? And uh, quite finally now, I want to um, uh, show you that this nucleotide diversity, which is this one here, pi, the average number of pairwise differences, this actually is highly changeable even in mammals you see carnivores um, whales and uh, horses and so on they have really low nucleotide diversity whereas other animals like rodents rabbits bats they have a much higher nucleotide diversity why is there a difference in nucleotide diversity in these different species the first reason could be that some mammals have a large effective population size Okay, so, for example, if you have to count how many lions there are, there are much fewer lions compared to rats, aren't there? 
there are many plenty of rats and mice right so the effective size of r rodents are, is much larger there are plenty of rabbits so the effective size is larger okay so that's why you can have more remember i said the bigger the effective size ne the more genetic diversity right so so the bigger your effective population size the more genetic diversity you will have that could be one reason and some mammals might have a different mutation rate so the higher is your mutation rate the more genetic diversity you will have as well okay and that leads me to lecture 37 and that is going to be a lecture on how we infer selection how do we say whether darwin's theory is working on these this piece of dna or not okay and that will be in our next lecture